This is The Bandwagon, a podcast about baseball and which dudes are our guys. I'm Hannah Kaiser, a baseball writer at Yahoo Sports, joined as always by Zach Kreiser, also a baseball writer at Yahoo Sports. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm better than you because I was sick and now you're sick. And yeah, I did it has not been transferred. give it to you. I don't think. We did think. not see each other at any point. <laughs> No. Um, we're just continuing to chalk this illness up to uh, All Star and Seattle, even though you're probably too far removed for that to be the case. Yeah, there's probably something else to blame, but I don't know what it is. So, did you watch a lot of baseball this weekend? I'm going to put you on the spot. I don't. I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I did I don't, not. No. Okay. <laughs> I I texted you this this morning. I was visiting my family down in South Jersey, and so I exclusively was only allowed to watch Phillies games. Uh, and not only was I only allowed to watch Phillies games, I told my dad this. Sorry, I think you might listen to this podcast and he's not going to find this characterization of him to be flattering whatsoever. <laughs> he's going to be like legitimately annoyed about this. But I told him this, so it's not going to come as a surprise. It is, have you, in the course of your professional baseball covering days, watched baseball with like just a, a through and through fan, someone who can only view it through the lens of like one team? Well, yes, all the time. I know, because your girlfriend's a big fan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but like, at some point in the weekend, I told my dad that I was like, it is difficult, I'm sorry, to watch baseball with you because you provide uh, a running play-by-play that is inaccurate, that is just the most pessimistic view of what is about to happen. And so if I look away for a moment, it's very confusing <laughs> because like, it'll just be like bases loaded one out and he'll be like, oh, okay, a double play. And I'll be like, really? And he'll be like, no, that's just what I think is going to happen. And I'm like, all right, please, I, 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 please just stick to what's actually happening. So that <laughs> it's not like, just like, just, just whiplash back and forth from like, this is the best thing that's ever happened to like, this guy's never gotten a hit in the history of his life. Yeah, see, I've mostly learned to tune that out with watching the Mets, but then it's also usually true. So it kind of just <laughs> works with the Mets. It's like, ah, eh, they're going to hit into a double play and not score with the bases loaded anyway. So, well, yes, to the Phillies discredit, my dad was more often than not correct, if not in immediate outcome, than certainly in spirit. Like what some inning and he was like. He was like, if I could take bets on this being three strikeouts in a row, I would. And then like the first pitch, whoever it was, like flied out. And he was like, OK, I lost that bet. And I was like, well, correct in spirit. But <laughs> um, all right. Right before we were recording, I asked you if you had seen Anthony Rizzo's Taylor Swift comments. Uh, please tell me what you would have said if I had let you answer it before we started recording. I believe that Anthony Rizzo changed his walk up music to a Taylor Swift song and immediately went four for four. And to, you know, for some background, Anthony Rizzo, like the rest of the Yankees, has had a real rough time the last month or so. So am I correct? That is, although I realized as I was speaking that I don't actually know which song it was. So I am going to Google. So please keep speaking for like 30 seconds while I check which song it was. He switched his music to Ready For It um, off Taylor Swift's 2017 reputation, which is good. That that leads to a point that I was going to make. But first, his comments, weirdly, were like Taylor Swift boosting the economy in every city that she goes to. And I was like, that is a take people usually don't immediately jump to with respect to pop stars. But you're right. Taylor Swift, job creator. That's Anthony Rizzo's favorite part of Taylor Swift. <laughs> Do we think Anthony Rizzo reads like the Financial Times or the Economist or something? I would Just love a big for that financial to be, press guy. Yes, exactly. His only his only understanding of Taylor Swift is through like some article in the Wall Street Journal about like <laughs> the revenue generated by her heiress tour. Uh, no. So that is what happened. Those were his comments. He credited her as um, a job creator, which I suppose she is in addition to being a musical genius. Now to circle back, he switched his walk up song to Ready For It off of Taylor Swift's 2017 album, Reputation, as I said. And I would just like to make the point that far too often athletes and i'm basing this off being fed a lot of tiktoks on my for you page of <laughs> nfl players in training camp responding to like what's your favorite taylor swift song far too many male athletes are only aware of taylor swift's early work get a lot of shake it off love story you belong with me the one where she's wearing glasses in a window holding up a sign that's you belong with me 
And they're not listening to her later work, which is way better. I just like I I implore <laughs> you athletes out there. If you are an athlete and you're like, wow, people really love Taylor Swift. I guess everybody just like loves 22. That's another one. Or we are never getting back together. The one that was like famously remixed with goats screaming. That is not her best work. Certainly not if you are like a mid 20s dude, probably or even like an early 30s. Like, please check out Reputation, which is not her most critically acclaimed album, but certainly the one that I think would resonate the most with young men. And then her more recent work, Folklore. Uh, what was the one that came after Folklore? I was like similar to Folklore. Everlast Evermore. Or Evermore. Evermore. Yeah. Evermore. And Midnight's. Yeah. So, so here's the thing. I, I agree that they should check out her later work, but, and reputation seems like great for athlete use. Yes! That's, you know, but you got to remember professional athletes, there's a lot of them who like country music and the, the country crowd liked that's Taylor fair. Swift's no, that's fair. early work far more. So I'm just, you know, just that's saying. a great point. I just want to credit Anthony Rizzo with picking ready for it, which I actually have long thought was an underutilized potential walk-up song. It, it, it starts with, are you ready for it? Which is like a pretty good like one-liner for walk-up songs. All right. That's our brief Taylor Swift interlude. Uh, we have some other banter that we wanted to get to, but again, sort of just reacting to things that are news to us today. I sent you this Mark Feinstein tweet that said the Reds have told other teams that they are willing to trade 2021 NL Rookie of the Year Jonathan India for young, controllable starting pitching. Per sources, Cincinnati has a glut of young infielders, and then they list the glut of young infielders. And I sent this to you as like, oh, look, this is like kind of actual trade news without being actual trade news. And yes. you had a strong negative reaction. So before we before we get to some more banter that's about things that actually happen. Different banter. Well, well, I prefer to banter about things that actually happen, but I understand that at this point in the year, everybody wants to talk about trade rumors, and I find most of the trade rumors to be like, well, this is just speculative and hypothetical, but this one is substantive enough, and you had a strong enough reaction that please tell the people your reaction. Well, I just, I don't find it to be a great idea to trade a, a pretty established performer at this point. I mean, we are very sure that Jonathan India can hit in the majors, uh, which is... More than we can necessarily say about any of the other Reds young players, which they're, you know, they all look very good. And I, I wholeheartedly believe they will have good careers and good rest of the seasons. But India is both the most proven of the under 37 crowd in Cincinnati and the seeming the, the leader of the young guys. Uh, if you watch the TV interviews, they're kind of rallying behind him. He seems to be at the forefront of a lot of this, which, you know, I'm not one to say that chemistry is the be-all, end-all of a team. You can trade a guy and still be good, but I think there is an element here of that might not send the signal that they are hoping to send in Cincinnati, uh, I'm fully on board with Cincinnati finding a way to make a big deal and get some controllable young pitching. I, it feels like India is a pretty tricky guy to trade and continue their momentum. Yeah, and and I I hadn't actually thought that critically about it until, <laughs> until now. Uh, but in Mark Feinstein's tweet, he lists off the sort of the guys who are currently in the majors: Steer, De La Cruz, McLean, and Carnacion Strand, who just got called up. And he said, and there's more on the way: Marte, Arroyo, Collier, Collier, um, Collier. And to that point, if you are trading with a team that is looking to shed major league caliber pitching. They're probably even more interested in your super high level prospects on the cusp, cusp of the majors. So you're right. Rather than trade someone who's sort of like already established and enmeshed in the major league team, if you have all these prospects who are coming, I'm sure, I'm sure one of these sellers would be happy to take a high level, nearly major league prospect off your hands because that's tough to get in this market. So yeah. Okay. Look at that. We talked about trade rumors. Uh, why have I been stalling? Potentially because the first item on our banter as written out in the rundown, <laughs> was that the Orioles have overtaken the Rays in the NL East. Uh, my Rays, my Rays are no good right now. I did not realize until reading about the fact that the Orioles had overtaken the Rays in the NL East that the Rays' largest lead this year was only six and a half games. So even though they got off to such an incredible start, the Orioles have 
have been good the whole year. Like this isn't sort of like a the Orioles went on like a, some crazy win streak and now they're like surging up the they were good. They've been good this whole time. And they were particularly good this weekend, taking three of four from the Rays. They entered that series tied. Yes. I think they they began the series tied and, and the, the Orioles tied. wound up two games ahead. Uh which is I the Orioles are pretty much playing to the formula. They hit like crazy with a bunch of young guys, some of whom have been up for a year or so, Adley Rutschman, Gunnar Henderson, and others who got here like last week. Uh, and then they have the best setup man and closer duo in the league, Yanir Cano and Felix Bautista, I think, closed out both of the games that they won in that series. Three. They uh, won three games. Or closed out several of them. And uh, <laughs> very, very good. Uh, you know, they're doing exactly what they are attempting to do. And I think especially now that they've seen this proof of concept of not only could we be really good this year, but, you know, now they have to be considered pretty good contenders to win the division and get that buy into the divisional round. Uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the Orioles play the trade deadline, but they are a great candidate for whoever the best starting pitcher is that moves. That is yeah. not Otani. Um, I, I, shoot, I copied this from somewhere and I don't remember where I'm really usually try to be pretty good about crediting people. Someone at the athletic and writing about this series, uh, made, no, you know what? It was ESPN. Sorry to ESPN for just assuming everything I read is on the athletic. Someone at ESPN, I think it was David Schoenfield wrote about the series and went day by day, sort of looking at, um, what the deciding factor was in the game. And we're not going to go through all of those, but pointed out that the Orioles are, abnormally likely to play for one run as the visiting team in extra innings games. That sounds like super convoluted, but basically the extra innings. They bunt. The, they bunt. They bunt. They, like the extra yes. innings games, they start with a runner on second. And the question was when that rule was changed, like, well, everybody just bunt now. And for the most part, they haven't because if you are the visiting team, you're batting first in the extra innings. You got to play for more than one run because you don't know what the home team is going to be able to score starting with a runner on second and no outs. However, the Orioles, because of how reliable, shut down, dominant the back end of the bullpen has been, they've been able to play for just one run at a time in those extra inning games. And it's generally worked out for them. So I thought that was a really interesting way of making the point that their bullpen is like very just reliable that they it it makes the it um it emphasizes the way that like the back end of your bullpen has really interesting trickle down effects you could also look at the mets for a, a counter example a different type <laughs> of way but that truly could go. like it's not just a matter of like if you have a good bullpen then you are more likely to win games that you are leading in the ninth inning but it really it has um further effects to sort of the strategic way of playing that game the last thing we're going to do in banter is our Shohei Otani stayometer, and the way that we're going to get into it today is: Did you see that the Angels media gathered for a group photo at Angel Stadium to commemorate potentially the last home game featuring everyone whose job it is to exclusively go for Shohei Otani, who will have to depart if he departs? No, that's yes. so sad. Is it or that something. just? Right? In case it was the last home game at Angel Stadium that Shohei Otani plays there, and there's like the contingent of Japanese media who I, I guess will have to change homes, jobs, yeah. something if Shohei Otani gets traded. Uh, yeah, they took a big group photo at Angel Stadium. I wonder what the Angels people thought when they watched that happen. I wonder <laughs> if they were like, we're not trading him. You don't need to do that. <laughs> well, you can't exactly tell them because then it's like, well, that's blown. So, but yeah, there's some apartment complex in like San Francisco or Baltimore or Milwaukee or something that's going to be very surprised when it's like, yeah, we got like 37 people who need to move in tomorrow. Yes. All right. So what's you're the you're the the Otani stayometer prognosticator. What's your number? I am. uh <laughs> I am up to, I, I'm going back up to 5.5. 5. Uh, okay. I do not think he's going to be there next year still, but I think he will remain there on August 2nd. I think that's probably likely. We, we should mention the Angels have been winning. Uh, they crushed the Yankees uh, or late last week, which was a bad sign for the Yankees. 
but also kept the Angels very much within screaming distance of the wild card race. The AL wild card race remains absolutely unhinged. Uh, so the Red Sox and Yankees are a few games back. The Angels and Mariners are a few games back. It's it's all kind of a mess. So could someone look at the Angels' chances and convince themselves that they have to keep Otani and keep going for it? I Yeah, absolutely. So stay a meters at 5.5 right now. Definitely. Um, which kind of undermines the fun little project that I participated in for the for Effectively Wild this past week. Uh, little little cross pod promotion. Effectively Wild did a podcast. They're a podcast. They did a podcast episode <laughs> uh, that I thought was a really cool concept. They had 20 different baseball media members uh, pretend to be GMs of different teams. Everyone was randomly assigned a team and a GM. And then we all made our pitches, our trade proposals to the Angels for Shohei Otani. And then they put all those together and they had someone pretending to be Perry Manasian respond to all of them, make finalists, they made counter trades, counter offers. And, and then uh, he was either traded or not. You should listen to the episode. It was really good. I listened to it even though I was on it and I never do that. <laughs> <laughs> You you had the Astros, correct? I had the Astros. I got very lucky in that I was assigned Dana Brown of the Houston Astros, who is someone that I recently profiled his relationship with, well, Alex Anthopoulos of the Braves, along with Perry Manasian, GM of the Angels. So that was a lot of fun. I think I took very seriously, and in listening to them, I didn't, I couldn't quite tell if other people did this as well. I took pretty seriously into consideration what I thought the Astros' interest in making a compelling offer for Shohei Otani was. I shouldn't say like their interest in Shohei Otani because everybody's interested in Shohei Otani and would be bene benefit from having him. I think the Astros are on the low end of people who would overpay for him and you sort of have to overpay to get him because they're not going to benefit that much from sort of the the, the two attendance. Months. Well, from the two months, but also from like the attendance boost. Like they are the reigning World Series champions. They're in the postseason every year. They are famously very good lately. And so I don't think that they're looking to sort of, in addition to, they're not going, they're not going to overpay for the ancillary benefits of Otani. I don't think like how I, I'm sure if, I'd be surprised if they're not selling out every game already. They're on a sort of, victory lap also potential also likely headed back to the postseason so i don't see them and they they also just like they have almost no pitching and they have a very bad uh farm system and the angels need pitching or else they will have literally no one in their rotation well, next year and the astros have pretty much the only dh where otani would not yes. be an immense upgrade so exactly. with jordan alvarez they would have to either play jordan in left field all the time uh or figure out something else I, I don't so yeah there's a lot of reasons why the astros are not the the best match for this but so i did i made spoiler i made uh not a super compelling offer to perry and uh unsurprisingly he rejected it but you should <laughs> listen to the rest of the pod okay we're gonna take a quick break and come back with a trade deadline themed game kind of it's just a conceit for talking about the trade deadline again and that's going to be our main subject okay we are one week out are we one week out from the trade deadline is it a week from today is a week from tomorrow it's a week from tomorrow yeah we are a week and a day out from the trade deadline but we are recording our last pre-trade deadline podcast so we have to talk about the trade deadline again I gotta be honest. You're getting my, bored of the trade deadline, aren't you? It's not my favorite time of the year. I will be more <laughs> interested once people are actually traded. I I have never played fantasy baseball. I don't know if you have. Uh, you probably you have. don't know if I have. <laughs> you probably have. I don't know why yeah, I said I'm that. In a lot of you fantasy definitely leagues, have. Yes. <laughs> We've just never discussed it because I don't play <laughs> fantasy baseball. Right. And I feel like as a person who has not played fantasy baseball, like. I understand that a lot of people who cover the sport professionally actually do play fantasy baseball because it is, I I believe people when they say it is like a very useful mechanism for learning 
about a lot of players sort of around the league. And I bet that it is also a useful mechanism for thinking about team construction and would you rathers of team construction, which I just have sort of no faculty with because I never played fantasy baseball and I am not a GM except for when I am playing Dana Brown on an effectively wild podcast. <laughs> Which is to say that I will be more interested to talk about the trade deadline once people have been traded. But that's not what we're doing today because no one has been traded yet, basically. Well, Shintaro Fujinami was traded yes. from the A's to the Orioles. And, and uh, Genesis Cabrera was traded from the Cardinals to the Blue Jays. And as we hit record, the Braves reportedly acquired Pierce Johnson from the Rockies. Oh, I did not see that. I am so, shocked. So, so far, we have... We have not gotten beyond the sixth inning reliever stage of the trade deadline yet, is what we're saying. Yes. Last week, we talked really high level about teams. Like, I don't know that we mentioned any specific players at all. We just spoke about, like, teams and what their windows are and should they be buying or selling and should we think about the trade deadline through a different lens than buying or selling. Uh, and so this week, we're going to take the opposite approach and think about it strictly through the lens of players and actually try not to get too bogged down in fit and team and that kind of thing and just talk about players who are likely to be on the move and how they compare to one another. You wrote about players who are likely to be on the move. How many players did you pick in that listicle? Well, I <laughs> I picked 23 uh, who could be on the move. I don't think all of them will be on the move, okay. but I, I picked the 23 most notable guys who I think could be on the move. Okay. We're not going to talk about 23 guys. That's too many guys no. to talk about. We're going to just talk about a couple of sort of pairs of guys. And then we are each going to say who we would rather have on our team if we were trading for them. Again, there's like a lot of nuance to actual trades that we're not like fit and prospects and farm system. We're not going to get into. All right. First one. Would you rather Marcus Stroman or Blake Snell? Yes. Yeah, so with the all of these come with the not counting Otani. Uh, disclaimer, if we're not talking about Otani, these are the two best starting pitchers who seem ev who seem remotely available. Uh, we'll talk about another thing later about some starting pitchers. But I, we will I think indeed talk about another thing later. That's a true statement you could say at in, any point in the podcast. Yes. <laughs> in terms of starting pitchers in their primes, I believe Stroman and Snell are the two best that are going to be available at this deadline. And they're both having really good seasons. Uh, Marcus Stroman is... Honestly, pretty much doing a slightly amped up version of the thing he does every single year, which is get a lot of ground balls that turn into like an ERA right at three or a little below and pitch a lot of innings, which is just every playoff team would take that in a heartbeat. Uh, and he's actually been better than a three R ERA this year. He's He's been significantly better. Uh, and then Blake Snell started off real rough for the Padres and since like early May has pretty much been unstoppable. He's striking out all of the people giving up none of the runs. I think his ERA, he had a kind of rough start over the weekend, but his ERA prior to that between there and May was like 0 0.67, which is uh, uh, good. He, as far I, he currently has the lowest ERA in all of major league baseball. So yeah, he's been on a he wasn't hurt that much by his rough start over the weekend. Again, I was crazy. He wasn't an all star. I'm like, <laughs> I, I've been this. I've been like, uh, this is like my Joker moment. Like I've been like red pilled by Blake Snell getting snubbed. I didn't think I cared about all star snubs <laughs> till till this one. And now I'm like, what the hell? He should have been in the all star game. OK, so who'd you take? So I would rather have Blake Snell. It's kind of just an aesthetic difference. And I will say, I think most major league GMs share my aesthetic, which is strikeouts Strike are better. Outs? Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you are a team that is trying to play in October, one of the things that, you know, is hard to quantify, but that we know is you end up playing better competition and better competition hits the ball more often, harder, et cetera, et cetera. And the only real counter to that is just giving them something they can't hit, which is Blake Snell's specialty. And so... I, I would lean a little bit toward Blake Snell if I were a uh, a serious contender. I could see an argument for Marcus Stroman if you were maybe sliding him in to be your number three guy or you just really needed innings. That was your top thing. Uh, but in general, I, I'm going to lean Snell. I think he's especially more recently. Uh, Stroman started off hotter and has been just merely very good recently, whereas Snell has been out of this world. 
Yes. Okay. That was the exact sort of calculation that I had written out, which is like, even if Snell doesn't go deep, it's potential to be more dominant in the postseason. We'll say slight knock on Blake Snell famously uh, does not enjoy adjusting to a new place. He <laughs> <laughs> He's like a so cat. He does exactly. He wants to he wants to stay in his little territory. So um now that he's finally adjusted to San Diego, he's doing quite well. And I'm not sure how we will So maybe the Mariners should trade for him because that's his hometown. They actually have really good pitching. They don't need him now. They pitching. don't really need Blake Snow. Yeah. They could he they should go back to the Rays where he already knows the, the I said that last week. Um, that would be fun, actually. That would be fun. Okay, you agree. No, I, I say that semi jokingly, like we don't have a huge sample size of Blake Snell changing organizations. Uh, only it's a sample size of one. But he just, I, I, my understanding of him is it takes him a little while to adjust. That is not an ideal attribute for a trade deadline rental. However, I'm still going to go go Blake Snell. I, uh, I will mention with Stroman, there's been a pretty significant rumor out there that the Astros are interested. Mm. and that's sort of the trump card where the Astros are going to take him, and then he's going to do what he does and also strike people out because the Astros. So, you know, if you're the Astros, do whatever you want. But Yes. Uh, maybe maybe Stroman if you have great defense, although someone should look into the fact that he's having a really good year relying on ground balls in a year when defense is hampered by the ban on shift. Has someone written about that? That's interesting to me, but not so interesting that I want to write about it. <laughs> I will say the Cubs do have Swanson and Horner is a very, very good yes. middle infield, so... All right. You you wrote these out, so you're going to have to explain exactly what you mean. But the next one is Cody Bellinger or the field of hitters. And I wrote, yeah, who are we counting as the field? <laughs> everyone who's not Otani. Yeah. It's once again, is there a hitter you would take over Cody Bellinger at the trade deadline? There's obviously positional differences, but honestly, also there's not because Cody Bellinger can play gold glove level first base, gold glove level center field. I presume he could do that in the corner, but there aren't many teams that would put him in a corner because he's so good at center. Right. Who would put Cody in a corner? Don't put Cody in, don't, <laughs> don't put put belly. Baby in a corner. Don't put Belly in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, has someone made that joke before? That's pretty good. Um, You know, the only team off the top of my head that would put Belly in a corner is the Blue Jays. So. Anyway, <laughs> I am interested in whether you think there's any hitter available that you would rather trade for than Cody Bellinger. No. I he's great right now. He's got a 144 WRC plus. He's hitting 319. He's 28 years old and has played in 69 postseason games, which is nice. And also good <laughs> postseason experience for a team. Like, But like, I, I don't know how much stock we put in postseason experience, but that's a lot of postseason experience for someone who is 28 and only just turned 28. Also, he's a former MVP and Rookie of the Year. He's going to sell more tickets than Heimer Candelario. No offense to Heimer Candelario. Uh, and I also just like, he's a he's, he's on a one-year deal so you're not getting like a lot of years of team control, but it maybe helps you to read like someone should sign him to a long term deal after the season because he's clearly rebounded and he was at one point a genuinely incredible player. And maybe that would help you to. So, yeah, take Cody Bellinger. Yeah, I uh, my one thing with Cody Bellinger is the he has rebounded. He, he's extremely producing better than he had in recent years but it's not in the same way and it's actually in a really weird way he doesn't hit the ball hard anymore he's not great against fastballs he's doing a lot of the like pull and lift but don't hit it that hard like Cody Bellinger is hitting like some sort of watered down version of Jose Ramirez which is just a really weird way to go for this guy who was known for just blasting the ball all over the place uh, it, it's working. That's fine. He's cut down his strikeout rate back to where it was uh, early in his career with the Dodgers, and he's still getting the power. It's just there's a lot of numbers underneath that, namely his average exit velocity, which is like a punchless shortstop level right now, uh, that don't scream this is going to work forever. So I don't know that I care about signing him to a long term deal, but I don't really think there's anyone I'd take over him for the rest of this year, especially because of the defensive versatility and excellence. Yeah. Uh, he's really unmatched in that particular realm. Uh, he's not walking at all. I don't know if you care about that, but like 
In addition to not help. hitting for power. Like, it's weird to be not hitting for power. Like, for both his his power numbers and his play discipline to go down. But for everything else to go up. Well, his, his power looks fine. It's just not supported by the right. usual markers of power. But I, the other guy I wanted to mention here is Lane Thomas on the Nationals. Uh, he's been a really good hitter. He's a corner outfielder. And pretty much ever since he began getting regular playing time in Washington, he's been 25 to 30% better than league average. He's not nearly the defender that Bellinger is. You don't really want him to play center field. But I believe he comes with more than one year of control. So I could see a case if you just really need a bat and you've got your defensive bases covered. I, I could see the argument for Lane Thomas, who has not, since he started having regular playing time, had the same ups and downs and weirdness that Bellinger has. I don't I feel like they're not going to trade him, though, because they think that their window is soon. They Do they soon. think that or are they just driving a very hard bargain? Mm. If they are, congrats to you, Mike Rizzo. <laughs> because I believe that you believe that, even if I don't believe that. All right. This is not going to be fun if we agree on all of them. We didn't check ahead of time. Next up, we have the second tier or third tier, if you count Otani on a tier, pitchers, Lucas Giolito or Jordan Montgomery. What you got? You go first. Why? You just well, going to take the way. other one? Maybe. Gonna... We'll see. Okay. I went with Jordan Montgomery. He's just having mm. the better year. He doesn't give up as many home runs as we touched on. Home runs are a currency in the postseason. That's really important. Uh, and even though the peak is lower, he's got a longer track record. I don't know. I, I worry that with Lucas Giolito, what we're seeing is just like he had an incredible but perhaps unsustainable peak and that he is just not actually that pitcher. I don't know. And Giolito strikes at a higher percentage, which again, as we discussed, strikeouts important in the postseason. But it's not as big a difference as it's been in previous years. And so I think you just got to go with the guy having the better year. It's just a rental. Yeah, I was gonna. I was hoping you would go Giolitos, but I, I'm going Jordan Montgomery. Also, I really like Jordan Montgomery. I mean, if you look at the absolute chaos in in St. Louis this year, you know who's been just perfectly good the entire time and not complained? Jordan Montgomery. Like this guy was on the Yankees under the spotlight for a long time and does not seem to be super phased by you know most of the city calling out his uh, catcher. Or anything like that. Uh, so I'm pretty in on Jordan Montgomery. He's, you know, I think there's questions because the Yankees never felt comfortable throwing him out there consistently in the playoffs. But honestly, that seems like a Yankees problem, not a Jordan Montgomery problem. So I would be interested to see Jordan Montgomery go to a contender and get, you know, he's a number three on a good team, maybe a number four on a really good team. So I think that's a good role for someone to land him. And, uh, you know, I think he's going to get himself a nice multi-year deal after the season. All right. We got to disagree at some point. All right. <laughs> you go first. Justin Verlander or Max Scherzer? So I really don't think either of these are going to move, but I put it in here because there are teams calling about uh, the Mets to aces, supposed aces. I I want Verlander if I'm trading okay. for someone. Excellent. We disagree. I feel Verlander's inconsistencies have been much more on the start to start. Maybe, you know, who's to say for sure, but maybe he was getting some better information and coaching with the Houston Astros than with the Mets. Yeah, you know, eh. Just throwing it out there. And I think at his best, he still looked very effective. And if he went to a different team, I could see him locking it down and just being Justin Verlander again for at least the rest of the season. Max has been, I mean, over and over again, we've seen the issues where it's it's hard to think it's not the pitch timer at this point or mm -hmm. some durability issue that is a combination of age and the pitch timer and and kind of losing some feel for some of his pitches on and off. Uh, I, I feel a little riskier with Max right now, so I, I would go trade for Verlander. Unfortunately, you convinced me. I feel like... <laughs> I, truly, though, like I was like, you know, I do feel that way. I think perhaps Max is... is I worry about him. I this is all I wrote for this was, I think Max is more likely to waive his no-trade clause to go to a contender, which is one of those like... Uh, 
ancillary factors we were not supposed to take into account. <laughs> I just don't think, like, I think that's a Mets problem and not, I guess, a team acquiring them problem. I don't think Justin Verlander is leaving New York. I think I don't think he is either. Uh, I, I but don't if think I Max were is asking either, about one, but I don't. I don't think Max is either. But I, I, it makes a lot more sense to me for them to look to move Max, if only because of the things that you are saying, which is that like maybe it's more of an age thing with him, even though he is like a year or two younger. Uh, I might just like this feels this feels like a continuation of some like underlying physical concerns that he's had dating back a couple of years now. Um, and also he just seems more likely to waive the trade clause to go to a contender. Justin Verlander, I don't think Justin Verlander's like, yeah, I'm going to uproot my life again away from New York City, which he has a pretty compelling and believable reason to be like, yeah, I like it here. My wife, she spent time here, Kate Upton, and like I spent time here. I believe all that from Justin Verlander and he just won a World Series last year. So I'm like, I don't know that he's uprooting his life halfway through like six months into moving just to chase another ring. The Mets are paying him well and all that. None of that answers the question of why I would want to have Max Scherzer over Justin Verlander. I think maybe you convinced me that I'd rather have Justin Verlander for Max Scherzer. Neither of them seem like a particularly good time while they're struggling. I wouldn't want to be around either of them when they're not pitching well. So <laughs> I hope they both regain their form. Okay. Yes. I am worried. I will say I am worried that with Justin Verlander. And again, this is more of like a Mets problem than anybody else problem with Justin Verlander it kind of just feels like maybe he was really good last year because his body needed a break and while Tommy John surgery is a long and arduous recovery it gave a man in his late 30s a chance to a break rest and he came back and was able to pitch extremely effectively a lot of innings late into October and now he is lay tired <laughs> I think it will be interesting if the Mets keep both of them. There's a pretty good case that they should say, hey, we're going forward in 2024. You guys go take September off. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, I think I yeah. I, I, I think baseball players need a break. <laughs> like, truly. Like, the, remember Buster Posey took 2020 off and he came back and he came had an incredible. And was like, <laughs> yes. They're tired. They're tired. Their body hurts. They want to rest. So, yeah, that's a good point. We should keep that in the back of your head for um, August 3rd when they have not. Bandwagon breaks. Bandwagon breaks. Bandwagon sabbaticals for baseball <laughs> players over 35. <laughs> um, all right. This is our last trade deadline. Would you rather? Uh, Tyler O'Neill, Dylan Carlson, Brandon Donovan, who of the Cardinals surplus outfielders yeah. are you calling about? This is a real Cardinals grab bag. You can have a different answer than these guys if you want. Uh, the yeah. only guys I'm very sure they're not trading uh, is Paul Goldschmidt, Nolan Arenado, and Jordan Walker. I did uh, think about when you were like, do you want to add any? I thought about adding um, Nolan Arenado or Paul Goldschmidt, but you're right. That's, it's not going to happen. They're not moving them. Uh, I don't think they're moving Nolan Gorman either, so I didn't include him. He would be my choice if they're moving someone, but I don't think they're going to move him. Uh, so I'm pro Tyler O'Neill here okay. against some reason. Uh, he, he has not been good, really, except for the one time. But the one time was really good, and I am pretty sure he's still a very good defender in a corner, like a gold glove caliber defender in a corner. He has the most raw power of this group, and it it seems like he has just had a rough time in St. Louis. Some of that is injuries. Some of that is Ali Marmel and that whatever friction that was. Uh, I would be interested to see him on another team. I think Dylan Carlson, he has just not quite hit the major league level like we maybe thought he was going to, which maybe makes him a good change of scenery candidate also. The Cardinals, by the way, if you trade for a change of scenery St. Louis Cardinals outfielder who has not played as much as you think he should, you might really hit the jackpot. I mean, this is Randy Arozarena. This is Adolis Garcia. They should probably not trade any more of those guys, uh, but they're going to. So, you know, do you see any of these guys becoming the next Randy or Adolis? That's why I so I went with Dylan Carlson in part because again external factors. So Tyler O'Neill, I'm trying to figure out exactly when he's a free agent. I I it's, I do not enjoy that Fangraphs and Baseball Reference lists this information differently. Like some of them 
one of them lists the last year that they're under control and one of them lists the first year that they're a free agent. It's a free agent 2025 for Tyler O'Neill. Yeah. Uh, and my point is... He's under Dylan, control for one more season after this One year. more year. Dylan Carlson has three minor league options left. He's not a free agent until 2027. As recently as 2021, he was their number one overall prospect, 2016 first round pick. This is the Randy Rosarena model where he has been explicit as recently about feeling like they're not giving him enough playing time. He hasn't been able to get into a rhythm. Uh, He was like almost in tears recently when he said, it's definitely tough. I feel like I can help this team win, but opportunities have been scattered and it hurts. Honestly, I just try to do what I can to be ready for these guys and ultimately try to help us win. That feels like a get that guy out of St. Louis and like benefit from the fact that a former top prospect is struggling seemingly due to, if not entirely circumstance, then certainly partially circumstance. And then you have a a top prospect for three more years with minor league options. Like that seems like a really good option. I don't I don't even know who doesn't need that right now. Like that seems like everyone should be calling about Dylan Carlson. And, and I will say Dylan Carlson is the only one in this group who is a legitimate center fielder. He can play center. Yeah. I'm suddenly like, why aren't the Cardinals any good? <laughs> so many Cardinals on this list of players you would want to acquire. <laughs> well, and yet they are not good. Yeah, I there's a there's some chance they don't lose again until mid September and we're like, whoops. Cardinals won the NL Central. But I no, they're gonna sell. They're gonna they're sell. They're gonna sell. They really need to resolve the hitter log jam and get some pitching that is going to be on their team in 2024 in any shape or form. Yeah. So it it makes sense for them to move on and chalk this year up to a lo- a loss, but there's still there's 10, a lot of guys. There's still 10 games back in the wild card. That Yeah. And they they've uh well, they've lost 3 in a row recently. But before that, they won some number in a row. They were looking decent for a hot second there after the All-Star break. Okay. That's our last would you would you rather. Were there any other off the top of your head that you want to? Eh. No, I mean, I think the the big other trade piece that we have not mentioned is if Josh Hader gets moved by San Diego, uh, there's no one to would you rather him against because he's pretty clearly the best reliever if he's on the market. Uh, oh, wait, I just thought of one. Sorry. Relievers okay. aren't that interesting. So we're going to stop your thing and talk about my thing because it's more interesting <laughs> okay would you rather while we're talking this is like a these guys are not going to get traded but would you rather Shohei Otani or Juan Soto so it'd be a year and a half of Juan Soto or six months of, or two months of Shohei Otani yeah uh Ooh. you know I wrote a column about this but if I were interested in giving Shohei Otani all the money to stay with my team forever, then I, I would go for Otani. Uh, I I saw something we had discussed that that I wrote about, and then I saw Joel Sherman actually had it from sources, which we had it from hypotheses. Uh, Joel Sherman had it from sources that Otani is very routine oriented, and if he goes to a new team and they help him nail down his routine and he feels really comfortable with it, that that could be a big selling point for that team when he gets to free agency. So I'm doubling down on that idea. If I have any interest in signing Otani, I'm let's say you're, I don't know, the San Francisco Giants and you cannot seem to land a huge superstar in free agency for reasons that are sometimes not your fault. I think that's the sort of team that this makes a lot of sense to yeah. kind of go over the moon for Otani and try to be the team that he becomes comfortable with and sign him. Either one is great. I, you know, the year versus two months, that's that's a big deal. It just sort of depends. If I'm the Baltimore Orioles or something, I might want Juan Soto, but you know. Yeah, I think I I think I agree. I think again, you said smart things and I agree with them. So congrats to me on coming up with a fun hypothetical off the top of my head and to you for having the correct answer. <laughs> Um, all right. We're going to do a bandwagon. Uh, this bandwagon, I don't really know what I'm bandwagoning. Just two things that I want to touch on. 
from a weekend spent watching exclusively Phillies baseball. <laughs> <laughs> We're bandwagoning ostensibly Bryce Harper because uh, he's playing first base. Finally, not finally. I shouldn't say that. It's pretty incredible that he's playing first base. But there was a long lead up to the potential of him playing first base in his return from Tommy John surgery in an effort to sort of go had Tommy John. Tommy John? That's what he had. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Yeah. Suddenly in my head, I was doubting that. Uh, and then he was DHing. And then he was like, I can't play center field yet, but I can play first base. And then in the second pitch of the first game that he played first base, he dove over a railing and tumbled to catch a ball. And the Phillies, I'm sure, were like, that's not what, what we meant, we meant. Yeah. when we said, what if you played a lower defensively demanding position? Uh, but yeah, he's been really, really good. I was reading an article about this from Zach Meisel in The Athletic because they were in Cleveland. And it included the line that uh, Harper stood behind the blue padded ra dugout railing in Cleveland late Friday afternoon, sporting a headband with his nickname, The Showman, a backward cap and khaki colored first baseman's glove. Is Bryce Harper's nickname The Showman? I didn't. I've never heard that before. What? Is this like... What subliminal marketing to Shohei Otani? Like that's what I was thinking. Like I was like, he's not nicknamed the Showman. Shohei and the Snowman, and the Snowman. Shohei and the Showman. Like okay, here's what Baseball Reference, a uh, arbiter of nicknames, or a a a conglomerate, a repository. A repository. Yeah. That's right. That's the word. It is. A repository of nicknames has listed for Bryce Harper. This is in order: Bam Bam, Mondo, Harp, Big Kid. Or the showman. I've showman. never heard any of those other than Harp, which is just, you know, that's, that's just his name. Yeah. That's fine. I've never heard any of those. Somewhere, I think I might have heard Bam Bam. Somewhere, like, Phillies fans are like, what are these idiots? Never watched. Like, but I would just like to point out that even in that list, the showman is last. I'm also fairly positive Big Kid was his uh, Players Weekend jersey, which means it isn't even really a nickname. It's, you know. It probably yes. means whatever he tried to put on his uniform got rejected. Uh, but yes, I, I will say I, I was in Philadelphia a few times this season already. And whenever I was there, Bryce Harper was diligently taking grounders and liners and throws and everything at first base. And I couldn't help but think that as soon as that pop up happened and he do dove into the camera well, Everyone in the Phillies dugout was probably like, we didn't work on that. That's not a thing we practiced. He didn't know you're supposed to lean over it instead of just throw your whole body into the camera well. Okay. Producer John has sent us an article from last postseason. This is October 23rd, 2022. Phillies players have given Bryce Harper the nickname The Showman. We both covered that postseason? I don't remember this. Um, Reese Hoskins mentioned the nickname during a post-game interview with Fox reporter Ken Rosenthal. We call him the showman. He always has a knack for these moments. He has his whole career. Pitcher Zach Wheeler made a similar remark after the We've game. We've always called him the showman. We've always called him the showman? No, you have not. <laughs> I'm calling P.S. on this. Um, but he is, in fact, always coming up in big moments. That's quite exciting. I just, I just think it's really cool. I think Bryce Harper is such a like fascinating, no disappointments player. Does that make? I haven't thought of like a good way to express that idea. But like the level of hype at so many different points in his career, and for the return in both big and small ways to be so compelling and you know what I mean? Like when he was a teenager, like the, the whole story of Bryce Harper is that like yeah. he was really good when he was a teenager. And then, wow, what do you know? He went, he went one, one, I assume I'm like looking, but yeah. Yes. Uh, and then he was really good with the Washington nationals after, and he won rookie of the year and he won an MVP. And I understand that they did not go to the postseason at any point with them or they didn't win in the postseason. They didn't win the world Sorry. series. Yeah. They didn't win the world series. They went to the postseason a lot. Um, but like, and then he went to the, he signed this massive contract and there's all this con consternation around how much money and a $300 million man who went to Philly and he was fantastic. He was been phenomenal. He won another MVP <laughs> and then they finally get to the postseason and like, oh, we're going to see Bryce Harper in the World Series. It was great. Last year in the postseason, he hit 349, 
he had a, I'm looking for other numbers to make this I point. I mean, he hit the, the crazy home run. The crazy, the home, crazy run home run is really, yeah. if he did nothing else, he hit the crazy home run against the Padres that, you know, but, you know, in 80 years, people in Philadelphia are not going to remember if they won the World Series last year, right. but they're going to remember that home run. And then on a sort of smaller scale, this sort of like, is he going to be able to come back way sooner than everyone like you know what i mean like all this talk of like he says that he's so dedicated to getting back on the field and he's going to come back sooner than anyone ever has and then also he's going to add another position and we're like dealing with a sample size of one weekend on the ladder but again it's like oh yeah he seems great at it. he seems like he's really good he does seem like he is in fact quite committed like all of the he is someone who is like cringe level of earnest about his love <laughs> of baseball and yet at every turn, the production delivers on that level of him expressing enthusiasm and everyone else expressing their sort of like admiration for his level of enthusiasm. Like, I did not think that a person could reach, what, 30, 30, almost 31 and say that like, oh, yeah, I am die hard taking ground balls at two in the morning about this thing that I've been famous for since I was a teenager and like truly continue to deliver on that. And he really has. That's I don't know any other humans who are like that. I am very interested in baseball players who, in addition to athletically being just like otherworldly, their personalities back up some interpretation of them being like, Oh, yeah, they would have been great at whatever. Like, if I was built exactly like Bryce Harper, but didn't have his personality, I wouldn't be Bryce Harper because I'm just not that, like, singularly motivated. I think that's cool. All right. And all of that uh, is also kind of an excuse to talk about a completely unrelated Phillies thing. I'm also bandwagoning Noah's song, uh, somehow making it and sticking in the majors. Noah's song is the... The Navy pitcher, who was once a really interesting prospect, and then he spent four years not playing any kind of baseball while he was serving in the Navy as like a, a like a captain, a a an ast a, a arrow. I am player. not going to be oh able to help God. you with this one. No, I didn't write this down, and now I am not remembering it off the top of my head. Can we cut this part out where I Google <laughs> what it was that he did in the Navy in air in planes? He was in a plane. He was somehow in a plane. Oh God! Why does it not say this? Where would I mean, it say this? I Google it's not like on fan graphs, like twenty seventeen in Wikipedia. Navy. Where is it? Why does it only have his baseball career? Oh, here we go. Here's his naval career. Uh, he was a Navy pilot. That's the word. That's the word that I was looking for. <laughs> uh, okay, he was a Navy pilot for four years. He flew in the air. He did air things. Um, and then he was back to being in the Red Sox system and the Phillies took him in the rule five draft, which means that they have to put him on their major league team and they have to keep him on their major league team the whole year or else he reversed the white, the Red Sox. Sorry. They got around this by putting him on the IL for a really long time. Pretty convincingly considering he hasn't played baseball in a really long time. And it probably, I probably pulled a muscle on his back. Like the first time he threw off a mound or whatever. And they were like, yep, he's going to be on the aisle. However, they can't just do that the whole season. They have to like have him back in the majors at some point because he's got to come off the aisle. He's got to return from his minor league stint this Friday. So like this Friday is the deadline for the Phillies deciding whether or not they can carry him on the major league roster as a contending team for the remainder of the regular season. So uh, that they can keep him. Yeah. So that they can keep him in this extremely cool like Dave Dombrowski pulls a fast one on his former team player acquisition story. He's pitched 9.2 innings so far in the minors. He's given up four runs with 14 strikeouts. And they uh, most recently had him throw two innings in AAA. Gave up one run with three strikeouts. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do, but I am bandwagoning me oh. following this story. I know what they're going to... Dave Dombrowski did not do all of this to give him back. <laughs> like, they are going to put him in that bullpen and see what happens. Yeah, I'm... This is a cool story. I wrote about this in spring training, like, spoke to him. First of all, he's incredibly intelligent, as you might imagine, as someone who gra graduated from, like, the Naval Academy and went on to be a pilot. He's fascinating. He has a really, again, like, genuine love of both serving his country and playing baseball. I think this is really cool. And I also just find the sort of like 
you know, rule five claim, is Dave Dombrowski going to be able to pull this off? Is this why he seems like a really good general manager, probo, president of baseball operations, head of baseball executives? <laughs> Dave Dombrowski. <laughs> you know, sorry, I called him a GM and then I realized he wasn't. He's a probo, but like, he seems this is why he seems like such a good baseball executive because he can do things like this and i want it to pan out because i enjoy uh trader dave and i enjoy Noah strong and do you think they're song do you think they're gonna trade him Noah song yeah no i don't i mean i well, guess they could but no I, I didn't think that i just mean because it makes more sense for him to like hide in Go the back to a of a losing team pen on a losing team than on a team that needs all those bullpen spots for players. If this were like, are you you you're not familiar with like how the European soccer system works in the slightest, right? Only that they have relegation. Because okay, people well, are always like, we should do relegation in the player market. You they don't do trades exactly. Everyone is traded for money, but there is such a thing as a loan. You can say, hey, we've got this player, Noah Song. And he's, you know, we are in contract with him, but we want to make sure he plays at the right level and gets playing time. So we're going to, you know, we're Liverpool and we are going to loan this guy to like a team in the Netherlands and he's going to play there for a season and then he's going to come back when he's ready to play for us. And if that existed in baseball, the Phillies would 100 yeah. percent loan Noah Song to like the A's. Right. And uh, or the Tigers and right. then have him come back and be there next year. I'm trying to think where they would loan him. That's like a team that's not going to screw up his player development, <laughs> but also isn't any good. Like, where could he go? Where could they loan him? Uh, not maybe the A's. That seems like a stressful yeah, place to be loaned. I like, think... I think if you're looking after your guy, you're not loaning him to Oakland. Maybe, yeah. the, maybe the Nationals, he doesn't have to move. It's close. It's like a, he could take the Amtrak back, visit his friends in Philly. He could watch them when they make it to the postseason. That's true. It could be the Nationals. The Pirates, you know, the they're Pirates, kind of out of Pirates. it now. And yeah. I don't think like anyone thinks they're being stupid with their pitchers. They just no. aren't very well, good yet. So Tyler Glasnow thinks they're being stupid with their pitchers. <laughs> well, that was the previous <laughs> regime. That was the previous regime. <laughs> Um, okay, so that's two mini bandwagons for the price of one. We're bandwagoning Bryce Harper, a guy who continues to deliver on promise, and Noah Song, and how closely I will be following his story over the next four days to see what happens. I truly don't know. Okay, that's all we've got for you this week. Next week, we will, in some form or fashion, be reacting to the trade deadline. I don't exactly know when or how, but it will certainly come after the trades have happened. We will talk about them. Uh, make sure you're following both of us on Twitter or Threads or Blue Sky or Instagram or wherever else people are being social online. I've kind of just reverted X. to posting on Twitter. I'm not saying it's that. called I'm X not, now. I'm not doing that. I just reverted to posting on Twitter because I thought it was kind of back. And then I saw the X thing and I was like, oh, it's not it's back. not it's back. Like, Damn. All right. Well, if you follow me, if enough people follow me on threads, I will be compelled to post there. And if you've made it this far, subscribe to the podcast and the YouTube channel. Leave us a five-star review. Tell a friend. And we'll be back next week for a trade deadline recap episode of The Bandwagon. <laughs>